However, uh, if we find that, obviously by having these standards, we will have the opportunity and the responsibility to go ahead and correct that. However, this is really focusing on many of the not-for-profits and or service provider organizations that are within the City of Los Angeles that are occupying our space. One of the things that, that we honestly can't say as a city today is that every single one of the leases today has merit. It has been vetted and it is at a responsible rate that we actually understand and can stand by. That is why we need a policy that put in place once and for all. There are organizations that perhaps, perhaps may qualify in the future for a reevaluation and they end up with a dollar a year. I doubt that very much and let me give you an example of that. Somebody mentioned about, I think it might have been Council Member LeBonge mentioned about how the burdens on some of these not-for-profit service providers that provide services to our community that we value are getting squeezed by perhaps getting less federal funding, less uh, third-party funding or what have you. However, if, if we by default are assuming a responsibility across the board of many of these organizations, a good thing that uh, came up by Mr. Labonji said, what if they're doing something that's really helping out the schools, slash the school children for the schools? Well, why are we taking the burden of that wholeheartedly and not requesting or asking that that organization pay some modicum of rent above a do dollar a year and perhaps LAUSD should be picking up some of that rent because they're certainly benefiting and augmenting the efforts that LAUSD's their, their, their direct charge is. You get what I'm saying? So right now what I believe that we have in the city of Los Angeles is a convoluted process where we can't honestly say or justify why each particular rent on each particular facility by each tenant is what it is today. So we do need to have a standard. There perhaps was a time where we could afford to ignore that and it was something that we could absorb. Today is not the time for us to just assume that that's absorbable by the city of Los Angeles. What we need to do is make conscious decisions and understand every single lease, every single tenant, and then justify it based on the standards that this policy-making body will uh, adopt hopefully soon. Okay? And each particular lease will be something that this policy body can and should take up on a case-by-case -case basis with GSD or whatever other department is involved with that organization. Mr. Alarcon? Yes, I absolutely believe that we, we have to have standards for these kinds of leasing opportunities. But, uh, but I also want to rise and, and say that um, in, in lieu of, of paying market rate rent someplace else that these nonprofit corporations would go, we would end up footing the bill on the grant. So historically we've been providing uh, free rent uh, or a uh, dollar a year rent or sometimes greatly reduced rent. <clears throat> but in, in lieu of, of reducing the, the grant, allocation and the effectiveness of the grant because that cuts into the services. So um, the city when it had space available would, would use these. Um, nevertheless I do think that, that you know over time with literally hundreds of these kinds of lease agreements, how, how many are there? Do you I think know? it's about 200. 200, okay. 200 lease agreements it's sort of uh, there's no gear and, and quite frankly with the uh, with the uh, clout of the local city council member weighing in on each one of these deals, uh, it makes it difficult to uh, maintain a consistency with, with how these uh, lease agreements are, are made. Um, so uh, I, I, for one, believe that we should uh, provide space to uh, local nonprofits that are uh, giving better, more value than what we would be paying in market rate rent. Um, the PALS program is is a program. The, the various uh, workforce development programs, the youth services program, the after school playground activities, all of these programs provide more value but would probably go bust if they had to pay rent. And so I think we have to be very careful as we move forward. But I do believe that every single time that we approve a lease, a, approve a nonprofit to get some kind of reduced rate, uh, I do believe the decision should be made here at the City Council and it should and there should be a specific finding relative to why we are making a reduced rate rent. I, I thought that was the policy. Is that the policy? Does the City Council approve 
every one of these? Usually, I think when a uh, nonprofit lease comes through, it comes through council for. So, but it comes as a package. Yes. So we don't necessarily hone in on the rent. Uh, but I think we, should, we need to make a specific finding every time we provide a reduced rate rent um, so that we know what we're buying, and so that we know that the value of the service arises above the value of what would be a market rate rent. And I, and I believe it does in most cases. It's just a question of gathering all that information together. Um, so uh, I know that I can tell you that when, when I managed uh, nonprofits and was a controller for a large nonprofit, and we were able to take advantage of some of these arrangements. The monitors uh, for the city of Los Angeles were very cognizant of, of the cost of rent and, and how we were trying to reduce the rate of rent and how, and, 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 uh, uh, how we were valuing it in the context of the grant. Um, I, I believe that's still primarily the case, but, um, but I think in, in these uh, budget times we want to scrutinize everything and see if there's anything uh, either value or dollars that we can squeeze out of these agreements. So thank you very much for your presentation. Mr. Reyes? What I appreciate about this uh, discussion is the fact that if we are in a place after this report to begin to understand our posture in engaging the school district or the county or whatever entity that's out there that has open spaces. In my district I have I believe three new high schools and one high school in construction. I have middle schools and they're all space taken up that, that, that are dead space in the evening. Some of them dead space in the weekends. Here we're looking at a budget crisis where our recreation and parks are going to be considered for some kind of a cutback. And so if we indeed have a relationship with a program that's affiliated with the schools, for example, perhaps we're in a position to start breaking these silos that exist within our own community because they are of different jurisdictions and or control. Uh, given that both entities are now in a place where they're losing funds. Um, is that typically driven by the council office of each district or is that an exercise that occurs from your office? I know I've tried my best to work with the school district but they have their policies, they have their insurance issues, they have the liability issues. These are the reasons why you can't participate or take advantage of the resources that are there. Uh, have you had experience in working with these other organizations in trying to create these relationships? I don't think we have at this time. Usually when it comes to a uh, nonprofit lease, usually the nonprofit lease we is initiated by the council office and we work with them with the nonprofit to put a lease together. Okay. So we'll wait for the report back. We'll see which organizations are involved and maybe that's a basis by which to go knocking on doors and say right. you have this, we have that, and we both have the same need. Let's partner up and then see if we can move. I tried that with the mixed use housing with right. schools and it fell on its face because of all the rules and regulations and quite bluntly because of the issue of control. One organization did not want to give up control over what they thought was their domain and the other did not want to give up either. As a result, the community ended up paying for it. Uh, in terms of lost opportunities. But thank you. And Mr. Labonge. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, that's a very good point. I see the CAO there who's got county experience. The most powerful committee that I always wanted to be on before I was elected here was the Municipal Facilities Committee, which is the CAO, CLA, and the Chief of Staff of the Mayor. I never made it to any of those three positions, so I never was on that committee. But they determined much. And what Ed was just saying is so important about the disconfiguration between county, schools, city, other government entity facilities. Maybe, Mr. CAO, you could put in the back of your mind to create some kind of organization that would be of the, like a, uh, uh, the only thing I can think of more recently, the Grand Avenue, uh, what are those groups called? Uh, GPA, Joint Powers Agreement. Maybe it could be LA Unified, LA School District, LA County, GPA for maximum public use. 
When you spoke about parks, Ed, I drove by MacArthur Park Friday night, 700 people on the north side playing. When I went by Lafayette Park uh, in Herb's district, a uh, packed. I went to Queen Anne for the opening of Wilshire softball for girls softball, 500 people. And they're there in these parks, and we can't turn our backs on them, yet the schools have their problems where they close their schools at certain times, etc. So if the CAO, I'm going over the center table, could look at that, maybe a GPA, JPA, JPA, GPA is grade point average, I need help in that too. <laughs> All right, if they could create that, uh, maybe we could look at these, because many things, even the track, that was fixed at John Marshall High, that Mike Haynes tracks, 41 years since I was there, finally got fixed. The school district has a little resistance to open it up because of their problems. Yet we put in a million and a half. Mike Hernandez, you were a champion for that at getting lights at Franklin, right? Your old school. I'm trying to get a field at Marshall, trying to get it open. It all works together. So if you can think of that, Mr. CAO. And again, thank you, General Services. Thank you, Mr. Lebon. It's J O I N T, Joint Powers Agreement. Right here, right Thank here. you, Mr. Lebon. Uh, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. Um, again, some of the things that, that uh, are responsibilities of the landlord and or the tenant are uh, we need to make sure that we have a status of general liability insurance on the property. Who's carrying that burden, that responsibility? Is it the third party not for profit or is it us, the city, because we own the building? Fire insurance, making sure that that's up to date and it's a proper amount with the proper kind of addendums and insurance requirements. Status of utility costs, who's picking that up? Uh, signed lease agreements, also uh, we need to make sure that we have all of those are current and uh, the status of the not for profit. Maybe we have a not-for-profit that 12 years ago has been running forward with a, a dollar-a-year agreement and they're not even a not-for-profit anymore. Somebody could sue us and say it's a gift of public funds to a private organization and there really is no nexus anymore. Um, and each tenant needs to, we need to identify as a, as a landlord all of those responsibilities, but each tenant needs to either be responsible for some of those things consciously within a contract or not. And I believe that right now uh, too much of those those pieces are, are loose ends that have not been tied up. And then also, when you own a, a property, you are a landlord. And with that title comes responsibilities and also legal and management expenses. And we need to be conscious as a council, as a policy-making body, what, how much of those burdens we're picking up for each one of these properties. It's a responsibility of us to understand that before we go ahead and, and allow somebody to, to have our space under certain conditions and responsibilities for another five or ten years rolling forward. So we need to be conscious of all those realities before we make those decisions. And also, an, an additional thing that I think the report should have is the report should inform the council of industry standards of responsibility costs. There are costs inherent in being a retail property owner. There are costs inherent in being a commercial property owner. And that's really what, what we are here. We're com commercial property owners, retail property owners, where activity is going on. People are coming in and out of those properties. Again, there's liability responsibilities. There's management responsibilities. What do you have a not-for-profit who keeps saying, we don't have enough money to pay rent? And then we make a decision and say, okay, fine. So keep paying us a dollar a year. They happen to be the exception, not the rule, rolling forward. And then all of a sudden, the roof starts to collapse. Well, if they didn't have money to pay rent, I can bet you they don't have enough money to pay for the roof, but yet at the same time that the contract says that they're going to be responsible for the roof, are we going to sit there and allow the roof to collapse? And then all of a sudden the city gets sued for $10 million or $50 million because 50 kids lose their lives. Those are the kinds of things that are res the responsibility of the landlord to understand and to make sure we're covered. And when we don't do that, then we misuse our properties and we misuse the people's funds. Forget about what the activity that's going on there. When we're delinquent in our responsibilities and we allow these things to hang loose, we are putting ourselves in jeopardy and not us as individuals, but we're putting the taxpayer and the people of Los Angeles in jeopardy. We are the stewards of these properties. That's the reason for this report. When you want to talk about individual leases, etc., that will come later once we've decided what the standard is. And if we want to create exceptions to that standard, it'll have to come on a case-by-case -case basis, but we we have to have a standard that we can put that against so that we can be honest with ourselves in deciding how much of this burden we're going to take on and not have the not-for-profit take it on on a case-by-case -case basis. I hope ask for your support on this, members, and also please include that in the report, industry standard responsibilities, and if you can get that to the members' offices, 
with the report and before the report comes out, I think it's important for everybody to understand with being a landlord comes expenses and responsibilities and there are standards of which we can benchmark ourselves against. Thank you, Thank Mr. Cardenas. Mr. Zine. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. The uh, question I have is the 15 council districts. Do you have a rundown of what organizations are using city properties within each council district? Yes, we do. Okay, if we could have that also as part of this report because sure. I've never seen that. But I think if each council district showed what buildings and what organizations, what the rents are, whether it's a dollar a year or a dollar a square foot or whatever the case may be, so we could break it down into those particular uh, sectors of the, of the city within each council district. We'll provide that to you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zine. There are no speakers in the queue. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Next item. The next item is item number two, and that was called special by Council Member uh, Cardenas. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you. <laughs> Again, this matter involves mainly the Department of General Services. Um, Tony, can you uh, bring us up to speed as to uh, what this entails, this item? Item number two is concerning um, asset management. Um, because of the uh, EREP, we're losing uh, probably 15 to 20 percent of our staff at asset management. And what we need to do in this particular study is to look at the particular services that we provide and put them in priority order and determine what we can, can do and what we cannot do and determine if there are opportunities for outsourcing in some of those services that we cannot do. Okay. How many properties uh, does asset management uh, manage? I think we manage square footage wise about 16 million square feet. How many pieces of property? Uh, I'm not sure. We seem to have David Pascal from um, our AGM over uh, asset management give you more details on that. Yeah, I'm looking at some of my notes. It says 8,000 land parcels and potentially 1,000 structures. And also that you have jurisdiction over parcels numbering 2,200 that are council controlled. That sounds correct. So my, my point, I wanted to bring that out because, again, ladies and gentlemen, we take it for granted. Obviously, we know we're a big city, 4 million people, et cetera. But when it comes to the, the asset management responsibilities of the city of Los Angeles, specifically GSD, a general services department, it's a daunting task. It's a lot of responsibility. And with that res responsibility comes a lot of men and women hours that need to be afforded toward that, those responsibilities. And as we cut this department, as we cut many other departments, it doesn't reduce the number of parcels that they have responsibility over. It doesn't reduce the work requirements that come inherent with each particular property, with each particular situation. So it's really important that we understand those things as we move forward as policymakers when we are cutting this department. And that this is not an argument to cut or not. All I'm saying is I think it's important for us to understand as a policymaking body what the magnitude of the situation is and how we may be hindering ourselves in the long run if we're not cognizant of how we're affecting this particular department when it comes to this particular responsibility. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Tony, or any of your staff? I think that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas. Open the roll on this. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Next item. Item number three, call special by Council Member Cardenas. Mr. Cardenas. I think three and uh, six, we hold those together. Three and six, right? Yeah. We will hear three and six together now. Okay. Three and six? Okay, yes. thank you. Um, LAPD, uh, CAO, um, IT department, can you please come forward? And CLA. Stay here. It's been a long-standing uh, request and requirement and effort by the City of Los Angeles that we consolidate our information technology uh, responsibilities and also at the same time, again, as was mentioned earlier on a previous item, if we're going to have exemptions from the information technology department handling 
those responsibilities directly and still leave a particular department with certain responsibilities, it should be done on a as-we-know-what-we're-doing basis, not just because that's the way we've done it in the past. So with that, I'd like the police department, for example, to give us some examples of responsibilities when it comes to information technology that seem to be inherently uh, the kinds of things that should remain with the department, uh, with the police department, which means they will have funded bodies and individuals who are handling those responsibilities instead of having the information technology department handle them. In addition to that, after that, I'd like the information technology department to give uh, some examples of situations and issues that they have been asked to ta take on task, but to date we have not transferred those tasks to their responsibilities. Therefore, we may have some duplication going on uh, to this date. Uh, Sandy Joe MacArthur from the police department. Mark Wolf with ITA. Jacob Rexer with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. And Karen Kalfan with the CLA's office. Thank you. Okay, the police department's been working really closely with ITA in the recent months, actually since the first of the year, looking at the issues that were facing us with ERIP, losing personnel, also now with people leaving and the potential of people leaving to some of the special funded positions and other entities. And we've talked about the consolidation, looking for efficiencies and cost savings. Um, specifically, the infrastructure, the department is convinced, really can go to ITA without any issues. And currently, as you know, the, the police department has in the past been really supporting its own infrastructure. And we feel that that can really meet some of the consolidation need, needs. We've been working with Mark and Randy on these issues in particular. So those are some of the entities that we think that can go over uh, specifically to ITA. We've worked with ITA in terms of some of the background issues. Uh, as you know, some of our, our people have to go through backgrounds when you're talking about sensitive, confidential uh, pieces of information that we would want to keep or if we do consolidate with ITA and have people specific at ITA to handle. And Randy's um, committed to making sure that any person over at ITA that would be handling any confidential materials through our department or data, they would meet the same requirements that our people would meet as well. So those are some of the examples. Maggie Goodrich here, who's in charge of ITB, can speak a little bit more to some of the things that we would like to retain. Good morning, Maggie Goodrich, Commanding Officer, Information Technology Bureau for the LAPD. Um, there are particular things that we would probably need to retain, very specific to um, police department software applications uh, that are used on a regular basis by detectives, patrol, um, whomever. And uh, it, it, Randy and I have actually been talking about what those applications are, how they would be supported, and what we would need to, to maintain versus what ITA, um, we could consolidate with ITA. And um, they, as Chief MacArthur said, basically infrastructure type things that are common to really all city departments are certainly things that we could look to consolidate where there may be some very specific PD applications that we would have to kind of address one by one to determine whether or not they could be consolidated. Thank you. Uh, but one of the things I mentioned earlier is we may have duplication when it comes to people doing work. However, uh, information technology is a vast infrastructure of the city of Los Angeles, like it is with any large or small organization. In this case, we're a very large organization, large police department, large city, many departments. However, when we identify efficiencies, we can also identify efficiencies of space, right? Because yes. a lot of these systems require space. And not only space, they require the right kind of facility with air conditioning and temperature controls, things of that nature, uh, access, accessibility requirements, all that kind of infrastructure. And if we can start consolidating appropriately many of these uh, duplications, we will be saving not only time of, of, of uh, time and money when it comes to the bodies or people that are charged with taking care of these things, but also just the infrastructure itself is a cost inherent in maintaining these facilities. Yes, we agree with that. In fact, that's why we were starting to look at the infrastructure first because we feel that's where the biggest cost savings could, and efficiencies could take place and could take place in re relatively short order. Mm -hmm. And the, the lowest, lowest estimate, uh, council members, that we're estimating that the city of Los Angeles uses on an annual basis when it comes to infrastructure costs personnel costs when it comes to information technology, infrastructure, keeping this city moving 
with this responsibility is easily two hundred a quarter of a million a quarter of a billion dollars two hundred fifty million dollars minimum it's probably closer to five hundred million when we get honest with ourselves and we look at all the little tiny details the big programs the small programs the upgrades the licensing the personnel whether we're contracting out to maintain this program or we have in-house people doing so we're probably closer to five hundred million dollars annually that means if we spend $500 million this year and we're not as efficient as we should be, we're going to spend $500 million next year and the next and the next. But if we can find efficiencies, for example, this year that we cut back $37 million, $97 million on a 12-month basis, that means we're likely going to be able to duplicate that year after year after year and just think of the savings to the taxpayers and our ability to tighten our belts. This is an area where we can tighten our belts, but it's going to take... Uh, it's going to take cooperation from all departments within the city, small and large. And the information technology department is going to have to be given the responsibility, and they're going to have to be responsible with taking responsibility for many of those issues that they were not responsible in the past, or particular departments didn't want to let go of it. IT? Thank you, Council Member. ITA, over the past eight months, back in actually May of last fiscal year, began an effort in working with city departments. And as the chief has indicated, um, not only have we worked with the police department, with every other council-controlled department in the city, to really survey and do an inventory of the current systems they have in place, and also to look at their staffing resources and the responsibilities that they take on. As you've indicated, infrastructure is a likely target for consolidation. What we've looked at in terms of prioritizing is to look at the duplicative functions that are performed not only by ITA but by the other city departments. And to give some examples for that, for the infrastructure services, and when I say infrastructure that includes management of the servers that run the computer systems, the storage that holds the city data, as well as the operation of the city's network that allows the, the systems to communicate, along with some functions like help desk and desktop support. Those are functions that are performed redundantly by both departments and ITA, and there's definitely efficiencies that can be gained by having that be a centralized function. IT consolidation in a city as large as Los Angeles is a multi-year effort. So there's no flip of the switch to suddenly turn on more efficiency and cost savings and uh, improve service by as a result of doing consolidation in that fashion. It has to be done in a well thought out plan and under your direction, Councilman, in working with the CAO's office and the CLA along with the Mayor's office and the department stakeholders, we will look at the opportunities that could be potentially folded into next year's uh, fiscal budget. Thank you. I'll push my button again. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Mr. Reyes. My understanding is three and six is together, correct, on this one? In your uh, number six in the directives, uh, in the report back process, understanding that we're trying to put our arms around a very complicated issue with a lot of layers of, of, of impact in every department, but is it conceivable to start analyzing this reconfiguration, if you will, with an eye on functions that deal with either revenue generating or revenue maintenance of different operations of the departments? Uh, it is one thing to process information. We need to keep the system alive, if you will. But isn't there a relevant priority as to which ones are of highest criteria because of their role with revenue generation and or attainment? Can, can someone answer that? Yes, Councilman, that is absolutely the case. Um, as I said, with taking on a task as, as large as this is IT consolidation, uh, there has to be a lot of prioritization, and part of the prioritization process is exactly what you're saying, looking at potentially systems that support critical functions in the city, such as revenue generation, LA tax, uh, the systems, the permitting systems that are used by building and safety and other uh, departments involved in the development process. Obviously, those are systems that are very critical to the operations of the city and we need to ensure that whatever type of consolidation or enhancements that it's done in a thoughtful manner. So currently we have a policy and an ordinance that we want to implement that deals with the fee structure of 
those who would apply for a dispensary for medical marijuana. Yet we don't have the connectivity between building and safety, uh, CAO, city clerk, finance department, because the system has to be put together. So we're in on hold, so to speak, because we can't complete the ordinance without the fee. And we can't define the fee until we know what the system cost is to actually process that action, which is identifying the site, doing the collection, and then processing that within our system. So that's another arm that has to be created for implementation. How long would we have, in other words, we're asking for this report back, but does that system have to stay on hold, or can we move on it simultaneously, or is this the wrong body to ask? I, I think that both efforts seem like they could be done in parallel. Um, up to this point, ITA hasn't been involved in the discussions about setting up the tracking capabilities to support the medical marijuana uh, data. Just as of last week, we became aware of some discussions that are going on between planning department and the city clerk, and uh, we've, we have had some discussion with them on it, but I'm not really at a, I'm not up to date on that issue. Okay, I, our office is in discussion. We're trying to put that in place. And because of the eminent cutback in positions, we're being told we have to wait X amount of time. And so I just want to get a feel for You've got these demands being imposed upon you now, yet we have these other priorities that have to be put in place because of the quality of life issues. Because the sooner we get this fee in place, the ordinance is complete, and then we can start identifying which locations should be shut down. And we're on a holding pattern for that reason. So uh, I'm taking this opportunity to share with my colleagues. If you're asking, okay, why aren't we moving on it? This is an integral piece that's holding it back and it amplifies the role and the prioritization that has to occur given the function of your department. So I appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Mr. LaVange. Thank you very much. On technology, one issue I wanted to ask ourselves, and I'll relate it to the county and go from Riverside County, where if you went to Palm Springs, you would see how they rated their restaurants. They did that in Riverside before Los Angeles County did it. Then Los Angeles County does it, and we have an awareness and a quality. You got the picture? Okay, what I'd like to know if ITA or someone could rate where are we, and not in an A, B, C, D, or F, but in a scale of technology. Because I also hear, and is it anecdotal or is there truth? And maybe Detective Sergeant Ito could add to this as well, Chief. When our officers go before uh, in trial up at the courthouses, sometimes people will bring up this whole CSI thing. And CSI and technology on television is very far advanced from what it is at the ALA LAPD. So I think, and then we may lose cases or someone who's right. Uh, Officer Smith, is that correct? World, not LAPD. Yeah, okay, all right. Whatever the case may be, all right. So this is something I hope, at least for me, is let's say if we are the board of directors of Los Angeles, I'd like to be able to manage in some way to know that in technology, the police department, on a scale of 1 to 5, we're at a 3 or a 4 or 4.5 or whatever it is. On street services, we're on a scale of this or whatever the case may be. So maybe this is internal to ITA, but you figure it out, you know, and then try to apply it because I think that would help us know are we getting closer to the gold. I asked an officer the other day if it is, uh, I know the rover, well, and I, MD, what do they call it? NBC. NBC. Can you punch in uh, a street light out at uh, 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 3rd and Hudson and that MDT? Can you put in, if I'm in the radio car and I'm an officer and I want to communicate a street light out? We can, we can put that information in. It does not go directly to the I know, department. But we should yes. figure all that stuff out. Understood. I'm just saying. Understood. And, and Chief, who would not to say who's better than somebody else? In the, in the country, what agency seems to have a grip? And I know there's large cities like ours that it's difficult to invest, but who's best in technology in that area there? What are some of the things across the country that we look for from policing and technology? 
in fact, we're doing that comparison now in okay. terms of technology. It is very complicated, as you know, because um, there's radio systems, and then there's the, the, the computer systems, and then there's the interconnectivity within the region. And we are we're actually doing that assessment now for best practices throughout the country. Great. Thank you. And uh, come up with some kind of figure so we could know if we were hitting it each year. Thank you. We'll work with the police department and the other departments on that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your questions, uh, Ed Reyes. And, and for those of you watching and standing around, yes, I have very, very good staff. Uh, my staff has said, you got something on your chin. I cut myself shaving this morning and I had to put some stuff to stop bleeding. I bled so much I almost turned white. <laughs> That's how much I bled. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I had to stop the bleeding so I have some stuff on my chin. It looks different. Probably think I have some of my breakfast on my chin. No, that's not the case. <clears throat> but anyway, appreciate the gestures and the communication, uh, but, but uh, it's on there on purpose. But however, speaking of purposefully, um, I appreciate your question, Councilmember Reyes, when you're asking about a particular department and a directive of the council, a policy matter that we need to implement. However, there's information technology requirements. If we're going to have a new tracking system, et cetera, that involves information technology, computers, men and women inputting information, taking information, evaluating information. Departments for many years have been given those tasks and they ran off and tried their best to try to implement those systems. Unfortunately, that's not the best way to do it. What departments should be doing is saying to the information technology department, which is that's what they do every single day, is say, this is the technology need we have. How can we satisfy that need with equipment, with people, with the right companies, et cetera, in order to implement that and hopefully as soon as possible so we can implement our policies. That's a perfect reason why when you look at item number six, it's relative to convening a working group to review consolidation initiatives and identify potential risks and benefits of consolidation. Just because we banter around the word consolidation, it doesn't mean that it applies to every single scenario in every department and everywhere. So the bottom line is what we need to have is the proper kind of vetting so that we make sure when we move forward with a consolidation or we choose not to consolidate what we thought it was a good idea at one time, that we have the proper minds and people vetting that so that we can make a good decision and then move forward with a good decision. So item three and item six is actually critical, especially when you look at the budgeting constraints that we have in this city. It's time that we get our arms around these issues, that we try to be as efficient as possible, and we get things de these things done properly. But that we're putting together the proper minds within the city who are going to be charged with these evaluations and making sure we're making good decisions going forward. And that's a perfect example, Ed Reyes. We shouldn't have to wait longer than necessary in order to implement our policies. But unfortunately, when we're all over the map or we don't have the proper minds involved, even when we think we've made progress and then we push that button on a new system and then it fails us, Usually we're probably having to go somewhere back toward the drawing board and we've wasted a lot of time and unfortunately in some cases when it comes to information technology, we've wasted millions of dollars and then we have to go backwards. We can't afford to do that and that's why uh, items three and nine, they seem like report backs, they seem like just a bunch of paper moving, it's not. It's about implementing a new system. Yes. Councilman, if I could add, um, I think you hit on a very important point. Uh, governance in the area of IT initiatives, uh, determining resource-wise what initiatives um, are more important to the city, which, which are the ones that should be focused on, those are very, very important issues. Um, as you mentioned, we have very talented people in the city doing IT, both in departments and in ITA. The difficulty we're faced with is with reduced with a reduced workforce you know as a result of attrition and layoffs and so forth it's now come to the point where it's not so much even a cost savings initiative it's really a survival technique to ensure that these critical systems that help us operate business processes business operations throughout the city to ensure that those systems are up and to ensure that they're reliable thank you for pointing that out that's that's one of the big backdrops of this responsibility the last thing we need is small meltdowns. The last thing we need is a large meltdown. And whenever that happens, we take steps backwards, and it costs millions of dollars usually to get back to where we needed to be. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Mr. Parks? 
Thank you, Madam President. You know, one thing, and just uh, uh, I'll date myself. Uh, having watched this process go on for the last 30 years, when it was just the, B, the big blue IBM at ITA, and there were not issues dealing with the uh, uh, computers that we have access in the departments, it was very simple to draw the line. But I think as you put forth this effort, what's going to be important is you identify what ITA can do that others can't do, but be sensitive that big departments cannot rely on ITA for every one of their needs. They have to have some operational effectiveness and they have to be able to reach in within their department or else they will be uh, <clears throat> a stranglehold on their, on their ability to perform service. So things that with the new technology or not new, but computers that they have access to that they can program themselves that are uh, standalone, those type of things, we cannot sweep all into one box and then say, call us and get you a work order uh, because their radios have to work, their computers have to work. Those are things that they are dealing with. And I think with police, fire, and probably city clerk, libraries are unique departments that require them to have the ability to hands-on because their operation cannot stop. And particularly with police fire, their operation is 24 hours a day. And so I think that's the balance that we have to look for. And it's no longer big uh, uh, mainframe versus uh, tabletops. The issue is they, the computers in the departments give them far more ability than they've had in the past, but we just cannot put a stranglehold on their ability to be operational 24 hours a day. Mr. Reyes. Yeah. In reading these instructions on item number six, there's a uh, clause that states number of staff with information technology responsibilities. There's another one that speaks to list of current technology systems and projects. Then another phrase that says source of funding for all systems or technology projects. When we look at the source of funding and the other relevant elements that go with it, uh, will you be able to specify, let's assume it's a grant source and LAP did a lot of grant sources for our systems, does that grant source, will you be able to uh, identify the limitations caused by that grant source? In other words, when you're looking at a whole system, mm -hmm. then you have subsystems that are funded, that has a life of their own, they have their positions. It's being funded by that grant, special fund, not the general fund. How much of the overlap are we going to talk about when we start speaking to this notion of this uh, sharing of, of, of resources and consolidation? I mean, there has to be a veil, I'm assuming, legally, as to how these funds are being used. Have you considered those dynamics? And just want to know, and generally, what your line of thinking is when it comes to trying to understand those impacts. Yes, Councilman, that's a issue that or a challenge that we've grappled with time and time again over the past probably decade. Um, there are definitely jurisdictions out there across the nation that have come up with ways to be able to meet the constraints of the particular a funding constraint for a special fund or a grant type source and be able to have shared infrastructure. So it's it's not it's not there's definitely some things that need to be worked out, but I think as we continue our look at this particular area, we'll definitely leverage best practice information that's available on what other jurisdictions are doing across the nation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Please open the roll on this item, Madam Clerk. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Mr. Uh, Garcetti. Okay. What I was going to suggest to Mr. Cardenas, um, just to keep consistent of what we're doing with all the other um, departments and other um, consolidations and, and changes, would be to have it come back here in two weeks instead of 30 days, since we're on this expedited um, track. And that doesn't preclude it from going back to ITGA. I would say specifically you can have them that hearing and stuff this week, but then it would come back here in two weeks. Uh, 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 Council President Garcetti, on that note, um, 
<clears throat> I failed to mention that each department in the next, within the next two and a half weeks are going to come to the ITGA committee and actually report department by department how they're doing and how they feel about these evaluations and the consolidations, et cetera. So we are having those presentations being done over the next two and a half weeks from each department within the city. So, so our timeline generally, colleagues, for making um, kind of our consolidations and cut stuff is we're going to do that for about three more weeks and then be done with this budget year. Obviously, it has a big impact on next budget year as well. But to be able to basically know and to indicate to the financial markets and indicate to our stakeholders what needs to be done for the rest of this year, we want to get that done in three weeks. So we could do, I don't know, we'll work on the timing. But can we put it in as a two-week, and then we can always extend it to three or whatever if we need? I, I think that if we shoot for three weeks, that will probably be something that's very doable. Okay. So if we um, can uh, put it for three weeks, that's fine. And then, obviously, everybody's going to have to work hard, harder and faster. All right. What, what do we have a date certain? So three weeks from this Monday? Or from today, I guess? Well, to keep the that would be the 15th, but I believe council's in recess during that time. Oh, that's during recess. What's our last meeting before that? On the 12th, which is the uh, Friday. In the okay. Is it the 12th? Okay. Yeah, let's shoot to the 12th. the 12th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. And with that, um, we open this, open the roll as amended. So 11th. So that would be the 11th of March. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll take a vote on that. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Next item. Uh, next item, Madam President, is item number four. Four and five. And uh, there's a request to take up four and five together. All right, four and five will go together. Mr. Cardinus. Mr. Cardinus. No common cards. No common cards. Can LAPD come forward? Fire? GSP? CAO, CLA. CLA. <coughs> this item is, is relative to fleet services. Obviously, when you look at some of our some of our biggest departments when it comes to their fleets, the police department, uh, fire department, many specialty vehicles as well. Um, but once again, uh, a big part of a lot of the, the fleet services responsibilities of ma maintaining and making sure that these vehicles are in proper order is uh, some departments have their responsibilities, such as the police department, but uh, general services has a responsibility of most other departments. So with that, um, can you please give us a picture of what that looks like for your department at GSD? Tony Royster, Department of General Services. Um, for the Department of General Services, the challenge that we have that we're losing a very large number of mechanics in our fleet services. And at this present time, we have about 11,000 pieces of equipment. And unfortunately, if we can't get additional resources by July 1, there will be uh, a certain amount of equipment that we will not be able to maintain for the city of LA. And that's very important. We're meeting together with a number of departments, with the, the fire department, the police department, uh, DWP, the airports, where we're looking to, to, to work together, trying to find different solutions or different strategies in order to deal with these issues. Some of the temporary uh, suggestions we're making uh, is uh, 90, 90 day authorities bringing some individuals back or 90 day authorities to deal with some of the gaps that we have. And also we're looking at the possibility of expanding some of our uh, contract work in order to get this work done. But our major concern is is that we have a tremendous amount of equipment uh, in the inventory, but we do not have the particular resources to maintain it. And we're trying to work with other departments to determine because of EREP or vacancies or transfers, if any of this equipment can be uh, removed from the uh, the inventory. So we will have uh, hopefully the, the, the staff to do it. But the problem is, based on what we have now, we have a huge challenge in maintaining this equipment. And my number one priority and concern over everything is safety. Okay. Th thank you. Um, police department, fire department, uh, how do you maintain your, your fleet? Good morning. Rhonda Sims, Lewis, Los Angeles Police Department. Um, our fleet is approximately 5,000 pieces of equipment. Um, 
as as far as our our staffing is concerned our staffing was to about 275 we had about 50 vacancies before it we're going to lose about 33 people the most of any civilian operation in LAPD as a result of Europe however what we've done is we put a business plan together to allow us to be able to still offer uh, an acceptable level of service to our, our sworn uh, staffing with the remaining staff that we're going to have we have consolidated some of our operations we've removed administrative operations from our our motor transport people so they can focus on their core function which is maintaining and repairing our vehicles um, what we plan to do is also work very closely with the task force that GSD is leading um, to work with LAWA and DWP and FIRE to discuss how we can better consolidate our purchases of vehicles when we get to that point again, how we can better consolidate our purchases of parts and actually also consider some possibly contracting of our parts um, and also um, consider some consolidation possibly of some of our technology operations which are, our mechanics are doing a lot of technology installs at this point um, again when it comes to maintaining and repairing our vehicles we believe we'll be okay um, however when we have these major installs of like in car video our license plate recognition we we will be asking the CEO to work with us on 90 day authorities to bring back some of our people we lost as a result of Europe those people already know our operation the learning curve will be eliminated the background issues that we have unique to LAPD will be eliminated so we b believe that will help us to supplement when we need additional bodies okay thank you fire department Daniel McCarty Los Angeles fire department our uh, fleet and the fire department consists of roughly 1200 vehicles uh, almost half of those vehicles are highly specialized vehicles that are unique to the fire department that are not found in any of the other city departments. Um, maintenance of those vehicles requires uh, time and training uh, in those specific different things that they have that, that aren't in the other departments. The um, repair regimen for our vehicles basically we have a reserve fleet for our emergency vehicles so we have a, in, in essence a rent a car that they can use while their vehicles being repaired we measure our effectiveness by how many of those reserve vehicles are in use currently we have over 50 percent of the vehicles in each of the specific emergency response vehicles in use meaning that our fleet maintenance is not really keeping up with our repair needs our vacancy rate right now is is just over 20 percent in our maintenance section and with the conclusion of ERIP our vacancy rate will reach 27 percent not to mention additional vacancies that are being created by people transferring to the uh, uh, non or the proprietary departments the um, the fire department's main concern is keeping the emergency response vehicles on the street and so in order to do that some of the other vehicles are having to wait uh, extremely long times for repairs one of our major challenges in, is in getting our parts in a timely manner so we can get the repairs turned around and we're working with the DSG right now, or DGS right now to get those parts issues resolved um, but our operation overall is a very efficient operation I think you'll find our, our shop is probably one of the cleanest and most well-run shops in the city and I think in order to uh, keep a priority on the fire department and its emergency service uh, role that it would be important for you to maintain the control over that priority by not completely consolidating our function with all the other departments functions and as you uh, said earlier in the, the IT issue uh, Councilman Cardenas uh, you said that this definitely requires a lot of vetting to decide which things need to be consolidated and which don't and um, I believe there are parts of our operation that would uh, benefit the city by consolidation and I believe there are other areas where it certainly would not benefit the city to consolidate okay and and also most of what was spoken to is item four but also item five speaks to having to do internal evaluations as to whether or not some of this responsibility can be contracted out and whether or not that would fit well or not with the responsibilities of the level of maintenance that each department feels and GSD feels that maintenance should uh, be kept so does anybody want to make a comment on, on how we're doing there and I'll push my button again madam president 
the fire department uh, currently has a number of vehicles that are under warranty yes. still, and we're having an extremely difficult time getting warranty service done in a timely manner uh, from those warrantors. And in our current contracts for purchase, what we've done is we have uh, included an option that the fire department can complete the warranty service and bill back the warranty provider, uh, which has worked well for us, but that puts more work on our plate. Uh, we do not believe that there are, are uh, so for some of the vehicles, we're not able to find someone to do that work to uh, basically outsource a lot of those repairs. <laughs> And also what, with the task force, we'll be looking at all those particular areas and coming back with more details in the report. But we definitely are looking at any opportunities are there for outsourcing what we can do and what we can't do. And another thing that we also must understand is when we get the outsourcing, is there a funding to pay for the outsourcing? The, the LAPD is more than willing to work with the task force on those issues. Specifically, we are looking at the, uh, sub, the parts issue. We believe we can all make some headway in that area and find some ways of saving some, finding some savings that way. Mm -hmm. I'll push my button again, Madam President. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, Madam President. Uh, the question for you, we've been through this deferred maintenance issue many times before, and I know the city did this in the late 1990s uh, quite a bit. I recall at one point that we extended our police force to the point, really to the breaking point, and went on a, uh, a five-car chase over into the Santa Clarita Valley in which two of our cars actually broke down on the hill going to Santa Clarita because our engines were just worn out. Um, so we have to have a knowledge in-house. In where is the breaking point on fleet maintenance where you no longer can maintain it to the point where it's serviceable anymore? Do we know the mileage on, on vehicles such as fire engines, police cars, etc., where we hit the breaking point, and that's taking into account new equipment versus 1990s equipment, but nonetheless, do we know where that breaking point is? And are, are we there yet? <laughs> We do have uh, calculated life expectancies for the vehicles based on our MICLA program. And the, um, the life expectancy usually is more in terms of years than it is in terms of mileage. But we've experienced with our vehicles, uh, all, our call load has uh, continuous, continuously gone up in my 29 years of service. And the mileage that we have on our vehicles today is, is well over what we used to put on them. Um, we have... Uh, does Concerns. that take into account the new style of vehicles which have longer expectancy than they did in the 80s? And right. We do have longer life expectancy on our vehicles. A lot of them are, are running, uh, you know, two, three, four times the mileage that the old vehicles were capable of lasting. But at the same time, uh, one of our big concerns there with the, with the mileage is with the uh, impending loss of MICLA funds for the future, we're going to be uh, servicing an older and older fleet in the next few years, which is going to increase our service workload. Mm -hmm. But we do have a pretty good handle on what uh, the life expectancy are for the different types of vehicles. Okay. Leonard Walker, Department of General Services, Director of Fleet Services, uh, same as uh, Fire Department. Uh, really the breaking point for us is number one thing is safety. And right now uh, we're looking at uh, a utilization study that would determine the actual usage by miles, such as the replacement cycles, to determine where that breaking point is. And that would set a standard within the city. For example, a car needs to be driven X number of miles before it's actually need a needs assessment, in other words. In addition to that, um, as we do our preventative maintenance programs, uh, the key for us, our breaking point, is we have to make sure from a liability standpoint that the vehicles are inspected as required by the California CHP for, for trucks and aerial equipment that works on the, um, the power lines. That type of equipment is mandated. So our point, our breaking point would be to place the vehicles out of service where we don't have enough staff to support the actual equipment inventory in the fleet. Okay. And on that, you mentioned just briefly that point, too, as well. When we're looking at simple services such as brakes, oil changes, things like that, are you going to report back to us on the advisability of just doing that as an outsourced contract rather than having these highly trained mechanics doing brake jobs and tire jobs? Um, the approach that we're, we're taking right now, and it depends on what happens with overall in the city with the different departments and what equipment that may, may be uh, actually reduced, 
but from an um, uh, outsourcing standpoint, if we have to go there, we're looking more at the major repairs that would be done, such as large uh, brake jobs, engine overhauls, transmissions, and such that could be outsourced where it takes a mechanic several days to do some of that work. Yeah. That work could possibly be, be outsourced and we can focus on our core our core day-to-day -day functions to make sure that the equipment is available to our customers. Very good. So that's coming back in this later report? Yes. All right. And the last question, over time, my last question, and I won't need to press again, is are, are we looking at uh, uh, further fleet reductions um, and looking at other models, such as leasing? Uh, and I'm not talking about necessarily police trucks or fire fire trucks or police cars, but as our general fleet, leasing vehicles, which the state of California does and, and certainly uh, other jurisdictions do, where we either give a contribution of the employee who needs a vehicle mm -hmm. towards the lease, let them lease the car and get the insurance issues off our back, get the monthly issues off our back, um, versus just buying a large fleet, which we have. Yeah. Yes, we're looking at that in our task force, determining what other options we have when it comes to if it's in the lease versus buy or whatever. We're working together to try to determine what will work in the best interest of the city based on the limited resources that we have. And the good thing about this particular um, committee is that we have a number of agencies involved, so everybody brings in different ideas, what they're doing and what we're doing, and come up with what's best for the city. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Just one last thing. You might look to the California, or the, for that matter, the National League of Cities to look for best practices models. They look at these kind of things all over the country and give right. reports to governments, local governments, on what's the best way to do it. So you might look to both National League and the California League of Cities if they have any best practices for fleet management. Sure. Thank be you. glad to do that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Madam President. The, uh, the cost, fire fleet, police fleet, general fleet, what's our cost? Operating cost, annual cost. How many millions of dollars? It's sixty million dollars for GSD. That's sixty million for GSD operating costs. That's well, that will help. That will help shore up if we go to a horse and buggy. <laughs> help shore up that budget. And that includes helicopter. Well, hay's not that expensive these days. Okay, so sixty million for GSD. Fire. I don't have the figure at, at my fingertips, but I will in a moment. And uh, police LA, fire. L LAPD fleet is about thirty-two million. Thirty what? 32 million, including purchases of vehicles. 32 million, 60 million. I'm sure GSD's got to be. Fire department's 10.7 million. 10.7. Uh, I was at the uh, fire maintenance yard just last week, and there's a number of vehicles that are sitting waiting to get repaired, getting to get serviced. Uh, it's coming to the point where we're going to have more vehicles out of service than in service. It reminds me of what happened in San Francisco when they had some major fires, mutual aid. San Francisco couldn't send equipment because they had so much equipment that was down that was not maintained. And I don't want to get in that position. Uh, one of the issues with the fire department and maybe the police department where the heavy-duty mechanics are going over to water and power, uh, one of the situations that we're facing is how do we share with the heavy-duty equipment, whether it's a tractor from the fire department or a tractor from general services or a tractor from the police department, how do we share those heavy-duty mechanics or do we share those heavy-duty mechanics? And is the backlog the same with every department when it comes to the heavy-duty equipment? And then I'll get into the motorcycle in the cars in a minute. Can you respond to that, please? Uh, the other day when you were at the shop, uh, you were correct. There were a number of vehicles out of service that were there. Uh, some of the vehicles that were there were actually uh, repaired and back in service available for use, but they're reserved, so they weren't needed in the field at the time. Um, but the, we keep track on almost a daily basis of our number of vehicles that are out of service, and uh, we have had an increase in number of vehicles out of service, but that yard is generally going to be uh, at least three quarters as full as you saw it on a regular basis because of the turnover of vehicles. With 1,200 vehicles in the fleet, uh, to see 100 vehicles there is not surprising, sir. And then you're short how many mechanics on the heavy duty side? On the heavy duty side, we're short 10 mechanics. And those are heavy duty mechanics? Heavy duty equipment mechanics. And what, have we checked into water and power? to see if they're short or over with the mechanics? Because they seem to be siphoning off from other departments. No, sir, I have not checked with the other departments as to what sure. For us, we, we constantly lose people to DWP, and just recently we lost um, one of our um, equipment repair supervisors over the weekend, last weekend. So actually, attrition, we, we lose anywhere from two to three people a month, just naturally. Now, are they fully staffed at DWP? Because I know yes. they have heavy-duty equipment, too. They're, they're fully staffed, you know, as a result of 
uh, people going from GSD fire department to D DWP. So maybe we need to look at some of this with the heavy equipment, how we can consolidate some of that service since they're fully staffed, we're not, whether it's the police department, tractor trailers that haul out the equipment or general services, where Water and Power has the personnel, they may have people ready to work and no work to be done. That's one of the situations that we face sometimes. One department has the personnel, we've got the need, they have the personnel, and there seems to be this big gap. We need to explore to see what DWP can help right. with the personnel that they have since they keep siphoning personnel into their department and this need to get this equipment, the emergency equipment, back in service. Chief, do you have some comment on that? Yes. Uh, fire also lost the equipment repair supervisor uh, last weekend and um, it's normal for us to have some attrition to water and power also. There was a time a while back when we needed uh, welding work to be done and we didn't have a welder available to do it. We uh, did contact water and power to see if they were able to help us out, but they uh, had all their welders working on jobs that were priorities to them, so we were unable to get help from them at that time. I think time. there needs to be a little more cooperation between the city family, whether it's water and power, airports, harbor, the police. I mean, when, when something occurs, it's the city of Los Angeles. It's not the Department of Water and Power or not the police department. It, there's, there seems to be a lack of uh, maybe the attitude, our department, their department, it's one city of Los Angeles. There seems to be this barrier where one department may not want to help the other department. But when the crisis strikes, the taxpayers want to get the service, and they want to get the emergency response to take care of the issues. Did you have something to comment on that? Angela Sherrick, Assistant General Manager of GSD um, over Fleet and Fuel. That's one of the goals of the task force, to actually look at the departments, all of the departments, to see where, uh, areas where we can work together. So DWP is part of the task force, as is airports and harbor, GSD, fire, uh, and police. So th these are some of the topics that we're actually going to be covering as part of the task force to see if we can uh, utilize other resources that we haven't in the past. And uh, just two more questions. What are we doing with Toyota cars in the fleet? And the second one is what are we doing with these uh, car companies that don't want to service under a warranty? Those are two issues, the, the Toyota situation as well as companies not responding to warranty work when uh, the vehicles under warranty. Avartan Yegian from Motor Transport Division LAPD, Assistant Commanding Officer. As far as the Toyotas are concerned, we have over 200 Toyota vehicles, but only 45 of them were affected by the uh, uh, recall. Uh, currently, about five or six of them have been, have been repaired, and the rest are out of service, waiting for Toyota to uh, call us so we could take it in for uh, repairs. So we took them out of service? They're all out of service and all the entity drivers have loaner vehicles for their operation. Okay, for GSD we, had, we have 263 uh, Toyotas in the fleet out of the 263, 245 of them, or we had three different recalls, let me say that at first. One dealt with what they call the uh, floor mat entrapment where the, uh, the floor mat on the driver's side was getting caught or a possibility of getting caught under the accelerator pedal. So um, and that took place in uh, September, end of September last year. We pulled all the floor mats out to eliminate that hazard. We're waiting on Toyota to come up with a vehicle remedy for um, solving that issue. The second one we had was a uh, sticking throttle. Uh, we have no vehicles in, uh, that's maintained by GSD for that particular incident. That dealt with mainly non uh, Camrys and Highlanders, non-hybrids, so we do not have any. And the last one was a brake recall, the most recent one, and we only had three vehicles in the fleet that came under that recall. Those vehicles were placed out of service immediately when we were notified. They were sent to the dealer and they're back in service now. And fire department? Fire department has 15 Toyotas. Two of them are subject to the recall. They've been repaired and they're back in service. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Mr. LeBond. Thank you very much, Mr. Royster. Thank you very much. The first thing you said is safety, which is so important on all the vehicles. And Mr. Zine, it's not a maintenance yard, it's called the shops. And Mr. Zine, Fire Department appreciates water and power greatly, and they work together. And if it wasn't for water and power, they couldn't put the fires out because they provide the water. So I want to make that square to you because you were a police officer, and you may not realize that. Issue that we have to say is our fleet. Uh, and, and, and I drive home. Uh, two ways. Sometimes go west uh, on Temple Street and go through Angelino Heights to Glendale Boulevard by Echo Park or sometimes I go up Spring Street over Avenue 19. 
all the vehicles in the shops there, half are covered, some are not. Uh, could we, uh, is there anything to do? And there, it seemed to be quite a few vehicles. You said over 100 vehicles possibly at the shops. Or some of those, could they be stored in our new stations and be protected from weather at least this time of year? If you could look at that, because it seems it's counterproductive. Most all of our stations, including the newer ones that have apparatus storage facilities, are filled with apparatus or other equipment that's stored inside. Right. Uh, at the supply and maintenance yard, you're correct. We have a lot of vehicles that are outside in the weather. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's the facility that we have. We try to keep as many of them in the shop, in the garage part, at night, or you know, for theft reasons and also for weathering. But the uh, the fire fleet is a 24-hour service fleet. We're used to being out in the rain, and so it's not unusual for those vehicles to be in and the just weather. Just to give uh, everyone an idea, what is a typical, what would be historically called a hook and ladder or a fire truck, which is the ladder truck? What would that cost? Uh, truck. Uh, apparatus costs uh, roughly seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So three quarters of a million dollars. That's with the, everything on it. No, sir. That's the apparatus. So how about how much more to put ITA in there and uh, the decal that says LA City and all of that? Uh, I'd be making an estimate, but I'd say it's probably another two hundred fifty thousand. So it could be a million dollars for the truck. How about for an engine or a pumper, as we know? Yeah, a pumper runs about four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars, and the yeah. equipment on there is another hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand. Right. And uh, from the police department side, a uh, police car, typical police car. Current police car is Crown Victoria, predominantly, and they cost about twenty-three, twenty-four thousand dollars, and. Uh, the uh, capital improvement, which is all the equipment, communication, and uh, emergency lighting, is about ten, fifteen thousand dollars. And if we if we add the digital link, car video, and ALPR, we're talking about more than the vehicle's cost itself. How, say it again. I'm sorry. How was the last figure? The the last figure would be about fifty thousand, fifty-two thousand dollars. For the total. For the total, the vehicle Including, and all the equipment. Yeah, equipment, uh, the siren. The light bar and the vehicle itself, so $50,000 yes, for that. How about a motorcycle? Motorcycles, uh, turnkey operation recently we purchased from BMW about $24,000. $24,000 with everything on it? With everything on it. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Those are important numbers to see. And members, all these numbers are important to articulate to our constituents to know the value of just the apparatus and then the value of the personnel who serve us, whether they're in public works or in another department, such as fire or police. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardenas is our next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there was a, a press conference, I think, in the last couple of weeks um, talking about some vehicles potentially that are recalled by Toyota or something like that. Um, I just didn't understand the purpose of, the, re, uh, of, of the, the recall, of course. You can understand the purpose. The manufacturer says we've got a problem, we've got to recall these vehicles. But I, it was, for the life of me, I couldn't understand what the purpose of that uh, press conference was. The GSD, were, was there something to be alarmed about? When it comes to the, uh, the Toyotas, what we did, our our strategy, we're following the direction of the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. And based on their advisory, we, we stuck to the team to exactly what they told us to do. So that's the particular agency that we're taking direction from at this time. Yes. In addition to, we've also checked with other uh, government entities and other uh, municipalities that have uh, Toyota Priuses and Toyota Camrys in the fleet, and they've also taken similar actions uh, that, that we have in the city. I, I'm, I can understand, and it's appropriate for our city attorney's office to be concerned with liability. However, um, perhaps what we should do in the future is make sure that there's a communication between the city attorney's office and our uh, organizations within the city that handle their fleets to make sure that they don't get too worried about something. Perhaps there's not much to worry about if, in fact, you're responding, talking about a, a national highway uh, organization that has standards, et cetera, that we follow. The communication seems to be very strong. However, um, obviously there was either some miscommunication or some misunderstanding between the city attorney's office and 
are departments who handle fleets that may have Toyotas in them, for example, that uh, cause them to have a press conference. What I don't like about that is I don't want to get the community, the public, and certainly employees overly concerned about something that perhaps is not a concern, especially when we've got it under control. So do, we, do we have a, a standard practice where you uh, have somebody email somebody at the city attorney's office or what have you whenever something comes up or do we have some rolling process that they can look toward? Um, I can tell GSC what we're doing. We're meeting with the uh, city attorney to put those policies and uh, directions together so we make sure that doesn't happen again. Okay. But did they make a phone call to you that you're aware of before they had their press conference? No. Okay. Yes. LAPD has a practice where we uh, notify our risk management division if there is any issue that they need to know about our vehicles. While we take a very uh, proactive role in taking care of the problems, but at the same time we make sure that our risk management is notified. However, we could also make sure that uh, city attorney's office is notified to ensure that risk management contacts them. Okay. Well, even if it's a simple process, I think we need it yesterday. Even if there's a simple process where there's a contact person in the city attorney's office and a contact person in each one of your departments, that somebody could either pick up the phone proactively from your department toward the uh, city attorney's office, letting them know where we are aware of this recall. If you need any, any more information, we've got it under control. Or where they can call if they haven't received the call and say, look, we're aware of this recall. We haven't heard from you that you're taking care of it. I think that's a much better way of handling things than having press conferences. And I'm really disturbed that it doesn't seem like anybody at this table received a phone call or that you're aware of your department receiving a phone call before we heard about this press conference or read about it in the news. The thing that bothers me the most is there's a lot of things that the public is concerned about. I don't think that we need to have that kind of activity going on that we have undue concern placed upon them or ourselves or people accusing us of not taking care of business if things are under control. If I could just uh, interject, I, I don't know if there was a press conference. There was a confidential letter from our office to the departments and the uh, council members. And, and I don't know what, how it leaked to the press, but I don't believe there was a press conference. Okay. Thank you. Well, either way, um, certainly the press is entitled to know what's going on in the city. However, I think it's important that we communicate with each other before uh, we alarm anybody outside uh, un unduly. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Zayn. Yeah, I'd like the response on the warranty issue. When the vehicles are under warranty, motorcycles, whatever the case may be, why the manufacturers, the dealers are not honoring those? Because once it's off a of warranty, then obviously we have to pay. So what's the story with the lack of support? I'll, I'll take the lead on that, Mr. Zayn. As far as LAPD is concerned, all the manufacturers work very closely with us. We have a tremendous relationship with all the manufacturers, vehicle or motorcycle, to take care of all the warranties. In fact, many times when the warranties do expire, they do let us know that they can do certain jobs while the manufacturer could take 50% of the cost. So we've had nothing but good relationship with the manufacturers thus far. That's the PD. The fire department, I understand, did not have that same kind of response. Correct. Uh, Mr. Councilman, the fire apparatus that we buy are uh, obviously highly specialized vehicles. Uh, they're manufactured. Uh, back on the eastern half of the United States. They, each one has a uh, uh, shop within 50 miles of our shop as required by our contract where they provide warranty service. Those shops that provide warranty service are uh, generally of a relatively small uh, size and their capacity is um, oftentimes uh, over, over uh, taxed with the number of vehicles that are coming in for repair. So it's not that they would not honor the warranty, but they would not do it in a matter in a manner that we would consider timely enough for an emergency service vehicle. So that's why we wrote into our contract an option for us to be able to do the warranty work and bill it back to them. And that, is that working? And that is working at standard shop rates and they provide the parts. So that's been a good option that we've exercised. Okay, great. Because I was concerned about that aspect. What about general services? Any problem with warranty? No, we don't. We don't have any problems with warranties. We work closely with all the different vendors. With the eleven thousand pieces of equipment we buy, we we always leverage our, our our buying power. If there's any warranty issues, usually the vendors will acquiesce and and, and address those warranty issues. So we haven't had any problems. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Zion. Mr. Labonge. Thank you very much. Mr. Zion says you're not at your desk, Mr. Lelange. Thank you very much. You just had a question. Uh, Tony, I know another, uh, Shell Jensen. Anybody remember Shell Jensen who worked for Record Parks? He was very creative in trying to stretch the tax dollar, and he used to sometimes hire from the hall to augment city services. The new sidewalk that was done before the expansion of the observatory and renovation was a hire from the hall job. Do we hire for the hall on any of these needs to play catch up? I don't think that particular type of system exists uh, in the city at this point. Could we look at, uh, let's say, Treg Technical College or sure. anything that we could do this? Look at that as opportunity. And Mr. City Attorney, I have a technical question for you. Is it patent defect on our Toyotas uh, that uh, cause it or latent defect? The patent or latent? And can we recover the cost that it relates to the time that these MICLA funded uh, 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 vehicles were purchased? It, actually, if we could just bring this back to items number three and four, or four and five, uh -huh. the Toyota issue is really a peripheral issue, and if you're getting into the contents of a confidential memo that was sent, I would advise against it. Okay, now stop me, and then if I ask this question, then to Tony, please listen to me. Is it possible in any vehicle, whoever is the maker, whether it's Mack truck, and I don't even know if Mack makes trucks anymore, or if it, does Mack still make trucks? Yes. Good, okay, good. Peterbilt still make trucks? Yes. Freightliner? Yes. And uh, Kenworth? Kenworth still makes trucks? Anyway, all right, or any vehicle from, uh, that's made around the world, mm -hmm. if, if we buy those vehicles, or a Pierce fire truck, let's say, or anybody like that, who are, I'm including everybody now, and let's say the fleet has a particular problem, do we get reimbursed if that fleet is off a queue for uh, more than just a day or two? And can we look at that, Mr. City Attorney? Is that a fair question? That's a fair question. Okay, so I'll direct that to the fair question man, the City Attorney. So if you could look at that and see in this discussion as you report back to Council. In the fire department's uh, current purchase contracts, we include a penalty clause for out of service over a reasonable time. Right. Okay, good. And, it, and Very good. reasonable time depends on the type of repair or breakdown. And uh, to the administrators from police and fire, again to Tony, which you started off so well, safety is our number one concern here. If you're on a ladder at a uh, fire, if you're up trimming a tree, or you're uh, connecting a wire, uh, all that is so important for safety. That's the number one uh, situation. So thank you all. Mr. Cardenas. Yes, thank you, City Attorney. I misspoke. Uh, there was no press conference. It was just uh, a lot of bantering around in the press about an internal memo, et cetera. But once again, my, the crux of my point is that we need to have internal mechanisms to make sure that we are communicating so that we don't have these kinds of matters uh, get to the point that it, this particular matter seems to have come to. And especially when, uh, as you responded, uh, Mr. Royster, there's really only a small, small handful of Toyota vehicles that would have even been affected by that particular recall. But uh, to uh, cause alarm or what have you, undue alarm is, is inappropriate. And at the same time, we could make sure that we reduce that potential by making sure we have internal mechanisms of communication with it, uh, the city attorney's office is rightly should be concerned about liability, but at the same time, I know for a fact that you're very concerned about liability, Mr. Royster, because you keep saying safety is number one. Not only safety for the, pa the people in our vehicles, but the safety of everybody around them, and also certainly if something were to go wrong because we um, didn't handle ourselves correctly, maintain our, our vehicles correctly, uh, attend to these recalls correctly, Perhaps there could be something, an accident that would occur that would require there's a tremendous liability upon the city and also our city workers. So thank you very much, and I, pre I look forward to your report back. Mr. Recording. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Briefly, I, I was a little unclear on the response uh, to Mr. Labonge's question regarding loss of use when a recall occurs. Not just this, but any, any recall. Um, what is the process by which the city is made whole for its loss of use of a recalled 
vehicle. Um, whether we have to go out and incur additional expenses for repla temporary replacement vehicles, whether it's simply loss of use, is there some system in place by which the city seeks to recover the value of that loss of use? And if so, who administers that? Does that need to go through the city attorney's office? Is it handled within your respective departments? Uh, talk to me a little bit about how that works. I think if, it's, if you're listening, it's similar to what I think with the uh, fire department. I think in certain contracts, there are certain time limits. If it's, for instance, if the contract says it can't be out no more than 20 days, if they go beyond that, there's uh, language in the contract that the contractor has to reimburse the city or a uh, particular entity for that particular vehicle's out of service. But I think the experience we've had, especially with the Toyotas, have been out of service at a very, very limited time and it's very limited loss at this point. Okay. Uh, contract with the fleet purchase, I'm not, and what contract would that be if these are purchased? I think it's a purchase of a piece of equipment, like we have a uh, fire apparatus. And if it's a piece of equipment that it's probably impacted by uh, recall, there's a certain amount of time that probably need out of service. Also, we have our director here of um, purchasing, Ken Dessowitz. He can give you more details on it. Ken Dessowitz, director of supply services, general services. <clears throat> The question you're asking refers to a concept that we call liquidated damages. Our contracts do have provisions for liquidated damages. So that these are unspecified damages for delays. And uh, there's a deduction of that amount from the invoice. That's how this process is administered. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I Forgive me, but I'm not. You purchase a vehicle, it's in service, and it's recalled. The contract has already been fulfilled by the seller of the vehicle. How is that then recovered from the seller or manufacturer of the vehicle, or do we just not recover that? The process I'm describing is for contracts for parts. Uh, we don't have a process that I know of uh, for the recall of vehicles. Okay. But what we can do with this particular task force, well, that's one particular area we can address and come back with a recommendation. Okay. Mr. Krikorian, maybe I could shed a little light on this. Uh, once we purchase the vehicle, for example, a police vehicle, it becomes fleet's responsibility to ensure that there is minimum out-of-service time. No matter what it, whether the vehicle is in service and in warranty, we take care of it. When there is a recall from the manufacturer, the industry standard is the manufacturer will do all the recall warranty free of charge. But it is our responsibility, fleet's responsibility, to have the control how soon, the, how soon these recalls could occur. We work very closely with Ford, Harley-Davidson, BMW, all the other manufacturers to make sure we get the priority to get all the repairs done in a very expeditious manner. As far as uh, the losses for the time, we don't have a provision to get money for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last speaker on the queue. Uh, Mr. Cardenas, you want to do the same thing with this one as well, or you want to move it? Okay. Um, well, there's some information uh, that we'd like the departments to keep us apprised of, so uh, if they could continue to do so. Okay. Okay. And in terms of the number four, uh, did you want that report back on the same time timeline? Well, um, if, if the council president deems it uh, impacting the budget discussions over the next few weeks, then we'll have them get back to us okay. in three weeks. All right. Let's put that. We can always continue if they're not ready okay. for something. Okay. Along with the rest. We'll amend number four to reflect the earlier language as well. Um, okay. Please open the roll on these two. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Okay. Those are approved. Next item. Item number eight was called special by Council Member Cardenas. All righty. Number eight, please. Thank you. Uh, this item has to do with our in-house uh, publishing division, also under Department of General Services. For those of you who are familiar with uh, much of the work that they do for departments and for our city council offices, etc., they, in my opinion, seem to be very responsive, very efficient, and however, 
uh, in these times, I think the crux of the what we're looking at right now on this item is whether or not we can, can and should keep this department, uh, modify it or what have you, and at the same time, is th should this department be confined to only doing services for the city of Los Angeles? Are they afforded the, uh, the ability and opportunity to do business for other entities outside of the city, such as the county of Los Angeles, other uh, surrounding municipalities, etc.? cetera? Um, this is a facility that is fortified with infrastructure. It's fortified with people who are crafted individuals. They know their craft. This is the kind of service that I believe that we need to be careful about what we do with this department because if we were to dismantle it or allow it to go away, I do not believe that we would have the ability to reconstruct it if we say, oops, that was not a good idea. I think we're spending more money with outside services rather than having done it in-house. And again, time is money, and it seems that this department seems to be extremely efficient. They seem to be very effective. They do a lot of specialty work. We're a big city with a, an array of responsibilities and communication responsibilities. Some of those communication responsibilities still lie within printed material. Printed material in some ways is getting less expensive. When you look at certain mass quantity opportunities with big machines like laser uh, machines and things of that nature, however, there still are specialty requirements that we require as a large city. So. Um, with that, I'd like to ask the department to start off with answering a couple of questions. First of all, of all the work that you do for all the requests you get within the city of Los Angeles, does every department and every request, is it paid for by the requestor at full cost recovery, or are there certain situations where the department has been absorbing a lot, some or a lot of work and not charging back to the requestor for that work? Actually, all of uh, Mike Layton, Director of Publishing Services, all of our work is currently charged back on time and materials. Uh, we have budgeted hourly rates. We recover all of our direct salary costs as well as the materials used for the job. So in that respect, yes, uh, every job is charged out. The only costs that are not absorbed at this point in time are pension costs, health care, uh, that sort of thing. And there's also been a question on whether uh, we should be charged for utilities and space rent. Um, that's particularly problematic because those represent fixed costs that as we move towards reducing the city's print volumes, moving work electronically, fixed costs will stay the same just by the nature of what they are. But in the context of you answering that question for, for the benefit of the public watching, can anybody claim that if we were to collapse this department and no longer have this department that does printing work for the responsibilities of the city, would that printing responsibility go away or we, would we have to just contract out and go buy those printing materials from one or various contractors that would actually provide that service to the city? Would the service requirement continue? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, that, and is anybody or any of you aware of a third party that we would contract with that is in fact charge, going to charge us only for time and materials? Not, not at all. No, of course not. In fact, they're driven by profit. We're driven by trying to reduce our costs. Okay, continue, please. Uh, and again, you know, we, it's been suggested that we focus on the things that we do well and then find so other solutions for the things we don't do as well. This is something we do very, very well. We've uh, lowered our costs five times over the last ten years at a savings of over six million dollars. This year, our, our total sales will be about six million dollars. So if you think about all the printing that the city does, uh, booking forms, citations, etc., and the cost of it, of it in total is going to be six million dollars. About a quarter of that is actually for the proprietary departments who can use whoever they want at this point. One of the problems I have again with being compared to pr private sector printing is that there, what, some of the things that we do, as an example, we have a copier program that saved a million, 1.4 million dollars the first year it was established. Uh, again, we've saved seven million dollars almost in, in copier charges over ten years. These are things that can't be compared directly to private sector printing because they're simply going to do the same thing we do, add a markup, add their profit. Uh, those are things that we don't charge for and they're, again, makes it a little bit difficult to compare our services versus their services. But in any case, their services, again, being driven by profit, are almost certainly going to be higher than what we've been, what we've been doing in publishing services. We believe in being competitive. We've been doing this all along. That's why we've lowered our costs um, so many times over the years. Mm -hmm. 
at the same time, as I uh, agree with Michael, and the whole purpose of this particular thing, this study, is to determine also concerning indirects. Like, for instance, we do some business with Department of uh, Water and Power and see if there are opportunities there to charge some indirects back and see how that would impact the, the budget and also with other departments. Okay, another thing as well that I'd like uh, you to report back to us is gather information from other entities that do have large printing responsibilities, such as the County of Los Angeles, such as other cities or neighboring counties or what have you, maybe even the state, if they do not have their own printing at the state level. Anybody who actually has to contract out who have similar responsibilities right. and similar masses, uh, massive amounts of printing requirements that they have, what I think you need to do is to, in order for us to look at apples to apples, is you need to make sure that we're afforded the opportunity to see just because we get rid of a department doesn't mean that we saved that much money. If we were to no longer have your department, it doesn't mean that we can score a savings of $6 million, especially if we find out that next year we ended up spending $8 million instead of keeping the department and continuing to have the volume of work that they've been doing for us already. I think it's important for us to understand that. I think that we're lying to the public when we lead them to believe that you see the headlines in the paper, the city of Los Angeles, the mayor, the council, whoever, determine that we're going to get rid of a department. Just because we got rid of a department and we can say, well, that was 28 people working for that department, the city does not save 28 people's salaries, especially when we have to disperse that in some other format, either contracting it out and perhaps equal or more expensive, or maybe if we're lucky and we did the right thing, it's less expensive, and we render the same service or equal service. But it's a lie when we go around claiming that we're getting rid of a department, and in reality, we may be ending up spending more money or being less efficient or not rendering the service at the level that we were rendering before. It's a policy decision if we want to render less service. But if we're expecting the same service, and we get rid of something and we end up spending more later, then we've done nothing right. We've actually done it wrong. And also at the expense of good, hardworking, talented individuals that if we made the right decision, they would still be rendering that service for us and they would still be rendering their talents and doing good work that actually is justified. So it's really important that we able to, we're able to compare apples to apples. Because just getting rid of the department, I believe that there are people in the city who are motivated to do that and score it as another victory. But I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, let's look at what we're really doing here. Are we really, what's the objective, by the way? When people talk about getting rid of your department, I think the underlying objective is to save money. And if we're not saving money by getting rid of your department, we should not do that. But we're going to make a bad decision if we're not given good information and so we can make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison as to what the future would look like and how much money we realistically would be spending at the volume of service that you've been providing to, for us to this day. Okay. Any comments on that, Mr. Royce? That's, that's the whole purpose, to look at, to provide the council, the mayor, and the different entities with the accurate information so you can make a policy decision on what's best for the city. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, to Mr. Karnas' comments about we've built this infrastructure up, I've been in that print shop many times, yeah, and I yeah. totally agree that uh, once we would lose that, we'd never, ever buy that back. The, the point where I may differentiate with you is when we look at the cost of providing service, you say you, you do it as a cost factor only, we aren't. We have a cap charge, right. so there is that charge is added to that. That's what private business do as well, and our cost for our employees frequently, particularly when you throw in pensions, exceed the private sector. Now, I'm not saying we should get rid of the big project jobs that we do, but my concern is, as we look at the very small jobs, the, the, the stuff we do at Central Duplicating, those mm -hmm. kind of projects, could we do a better job? Farming those small jobs out to a Kinko's or another duplicating service versus the salary costs that we bear uh, when we have that duplicating cost service across the street. Are we, an, are we really competitive when we look at those kind of functions versus the big print jobs, which I don't want to get rid of, which I agree totally we should never give up? 
Well, that's a really good point. And in fact, I've compared five different pricing sources, internet sources. Okay. The city attorney had a, a contract that they've recently uh, canceled and, and directed everybody to use our services. About the lowest cost per copy you can get out there is four cents a copy. And that relates pretty directly to what you can do in your own office. We're at two and a, two and a quarter cents per copy today. Uh -huh. And so again, over the course of 10 years, we've saved over $6 million just in photocopies. So I think that's, there's two elements. There's the large printing projects that you're speaking of, yeah. which are much more difficult to compare. And then there's the commodity type printing, which is the copier market. Mm -hmm. And again, we're, we're very cost competitive. Our color copies are 24 cents. You can't find that. Kinko's, I think, if you walk in the door, of course, is 79 cents. You can negotiate a, a lower rate for higher quantities, but we don't charge rush charges. We don't charge minimums. None of that. If you've ever dealt with us, you know, we do what we say and we do it in a hurry. So, so I take a document say this has got a color heading over Central Dupe across the street. Give it to them. The city charges me how much for 24 that? cents. 24 cents. Copy. Right. Versus 79 down the street at Kinko's. Exactly. And those are important, important conversations to have because you'll always hear the private sector is cheaper. And in this right. case, you're saying even with cap charges and this, that's what you're charging me as a council member to take my staff across the street. That's correct. 24 cents. That's cost recovered. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. LeBonge. little city history here before Piper Tech, there were uh, a variety of pins there for housing cattle. And we had to have it on the ballot to change the zone for that that caused the creation of Piper Technical Center, named after CEO and Piper on that. And their concept was is to put all these resources together to help cost and efficiency. Have we looked at any of those files that caused for the creation of this? Because the City Printing Bureau did expand since that time because of capabilities. Have we looked at that original cost and maybe discussion in our archives, which is also over in Piper Tech? Tony. Basically, we haven't looked at it, but we can do that. Yeah, I think take a peek. Yeah. I just think it's very efficient, our city printer, whether it's the Department of Water and Power printing, uh, with the exception, they have a print shop too, but they do their bill over there, and some other things unique to Water and Power, but you do a host of things. And do you do any additional outside printing, like for other government entities? Well, we, last year, our city attorney concurred that we should be able to sell our services to outside agencies. Since then, we've been very uh, engaged in this process. I did sell one job to the city of Glendale. It was an $8,000 job, and we ended up contributing back about $600 to the general fund. I'd like to take the capacity we have as we reduce the city's needs and extend that out to other municipalities and bring money that isn't here today. Right. Rather than take money from this pocket and put it in that pocket. I, I, I want to say it's shocking to know how much printing is done outside this country. And no disrespect to Ms. Hahn, who welcomes every container. Many of those containers have printing matter that is printed other places in the world that we should print here. We should be at a cost uh, in that sense there, but also reach out to other governments. And I just wanted to also say it's good to review this, but at the same time, let's see. MTA is right across the street. What does the county do? You mentioned other municipalities. I don't want to put printers in my district or in other parts of the city out of business, but I think we could be competitive when it comes to government printing, which is so effective. And then I've been to your shop many times and know the work that they do, and I think there's a value to it. So I hope we look at that as opposed to just saying, let's go out to it, because we may not be able to get our time. Because if we get a bid on it, Tony, and let's say we need an immediate uh, printing of some matter, maybe somebody else comes in and if they put more cash down at uh, Johnson Printing uh, in the City of Commerce or wherever that may be, we may have to wait and we may miss some dates. So. And that's what we're looking at in this particular study. We would make sure we have a balanced report and see what's in the best interest of the city. And that's what we're looking to do. Thank you, Tony. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Cardenas. Madam Clerk, would you please open the roll on this item? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Next item. That clears the desk, Madam President. All right. What is our next item on the agenda then? Motions? Uh, that would be it for the uh, council agenda. At least on a cost basis. That's the end of the agenda. That's correct. Uh -huh. All right. That's why we should stay in-house if we've already 
All right. Uh, no motions for posting and referring then. All right. Uh, members, any announcements? Any announcements, members? Any adjourning? Oh, Mr. Parks, an announcement. Yes, I have uh, one announcement, and that we encourage uh, the public to come to the uh, budget and finance meeting tonight, 6 p.m. at Hamilton High School at 2955 South Robertson, and that's the uh, budget on the road uh, meeting. It's the third in a series of four. Thank Second you. Any other announcements, members? Mr. Labonge. A continued great effort by our sister city of Vancouver with the Winter Games and salute all those participants who continue to watch. And I'll also say this, Ms. Perry, my family, when we've had time, we've been more together watching the games uh, and the excitement of the games of all the athletes. Uh, it's been a great uh, connector. So let's uh, salute Vancouver as they continue with the games. Hey, Vak, I want a motion to discontinue Monday meetings. We're going to adjourn this special meeting now. I already talked to Mr. And President. then uh, go back into the regular meeting. Actually, that's it for today, Madam right, President. that's it for today. Would you take the roll? Call the roll. Alecon Cardenas, Han, Wiesart, Corrine, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Smith, Zine. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.